sweatshops. In this video, I'm going to look at some considerations against sweatshops and some considerations in favor of sweatshops and come to a sort of moderate conclusion about the morality of sweatshops. I'm going to begin with some videos by a labor uh, leader. It's 325 in the morning in Dhaka. It's raining, obviously. Behind us, uh, workers are still working, garment workers. They're going into their 20th hour of work. We've seen this in a drive around Dhaka. We've seen this in maybe a dozen factories tonight. These workers will work until five or six in the morning. Maybe they'll get an hour of sleep and then they'll start another shift, which will be 14, 15 or 18 or 19 or 20 hours. It's hard to imagine that in the United States, it's August. People are on vacation. It's August in Bangladesh, and these workers are working 20 hours a day making our clothing. Do we ever stop to think who makes the products we buy? Do we ever stop to imagine the human face behind the label? All across the developing world, the workers who make our product are young people. 80% of them are women 16 to 25 years old who are locked in factories and forced to work under harsh sweatshop conditions. There are 1.8 million garment workers in Bangladesh in 3,600 factories sewing over 900 million garments a year for export to the U.S. All the giant U.S. retailers produce there. This is the human face behind the global economy which the companies do not want us to see. Each day the workers walk to work at least an hour round trip because they cannot afford the 10 to 15 cents it would cost to take a bicycle rickshaw. Each morning, there are tens of thousands of women streaming down the streets on their way to work. And again at night, in the pitch darkness, when they are let out at 10 or 11 p.m. The standard shift in these factories is from 8 a.m. until 10 or 11 p.m., 14 or 15 hours a day, seven days a week. All overtime is mandatory. On average, the women receive just two days off a month. When there is a rush to complete orders before a shipment must leave for the United States, there are grueling forced all night 19 to 20 hour shifts from 8 a.m. straight through until 3 or 4 the next morning. At the end of the shift, the workers curl up on the factory floor next to their sewing machines and sleep for three or four hours before their next shift begins at 8 a.m. It's not uncommon to be forced to work such all-night shifts two or even three times a week. The workers can be at the factory up to 107 hours a week. The women are exhausted and sick. Their families are collapsing and their children are left alone since they're never home. No one worker sews an entire garment. Everyone is a specialist. The garment flows down an assembly line and the worker repeats the same operation hour after hour, day after day. The factory assigns a daily production goal which the worker has to meet. For example, a worker will be given eight seconds to sew a button on a shirt. That's seven and a half buttons a minute, 450 buttons an hour, 4,500 buttons a day. For more complex operations, like sewing a pocket, the worker might be given one minute to complete each operation, or 60 an hour. The 
pace is relentless. The supervisors, mostly men, patrol the assembly lines, constantly pressuring the women to work faster. The women report being cursed and shouted at, and even being slapped, punched, and hit for working too slowly or making even the smallest perceived error. The sewing operators are paid 11 to 17 cents an hour, as little as $5.28 a week. The helpers, the young girls who clean the garments by cutting off the loose threads, earn less than 8 cents an hour, as little as $3.84 a week. These are starvation wages which trap the workers and their families in misery. In fact, in the developing world, the corporations have almost wiped out the cost of labor. The women are forced to work five or six hours overtime a night, but often the companies only pay them for two hours. When the workers ask for the wages they are owed, they are attacked, beaten, even imprisoned. The factories are hot. In the summer, temperatures can soar to over 100 degrees. The workers say that their clothing is often soaked with their sweat. The air is heavy with dust from the cut cloth, which the workers are constantly breathing in. The workers are not allowed to talk. They must ask permission to use the bathroom and are limited to two visits a day. And the bathrooms are filthy. The drinking water is dirty and the women often suffer from diarrhea and dysentery. The women are cheated of their legal maternity benefits. There are no sick days, no health insurance, no pensions. When the women reach 30 or 35 years of age, they are fired. The factory managers feel they're worn out and want to replace them with another crop of young girls. Since there's no proper place to eat, the workers have to take their lunch sitting on the roof exposed to the burning sun or to the rain. The workers have no rights. If they are even seen meeting with union leaders, they are fired. If management discovers that the workers are trying to organize a union, they will be beaten, fired, and often imprisoned on trumped up charges. I really like how that last video ends by just showing the repetitive nature. I mean, you get bored even watching them uh, work for uh, 30 seconds. Imagine doing that every day.
uh, for 12 hours a day. Uh, one more short video. How old is she? You I have 11 years old. How much does she earn? What's her wages? How much does she earn? What's her wages? How much does she earn? 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 How much does I give an absent one day, the following day they will beat and they will uh, shout at us. Kara person kare. Karapi. Kazi to bulele, karapule, mare boka de. If we make any mistake, they beat us, they scold us. What, what exactly do they do? What do they say? What do they yell? And do they actually slap them or what? Supervisor, I am going to take the house. Supervisor, keep away mare, but keep away boka de. And how many pieces does she have to do? Like, what's her quota? Target Koto, Agdine, Target Koto, what Koto, Pisco, we could take her. Shoot the cutter then. 150 pieces an hour. 150 pieces an hour. When she doesn't make the quota, what happens? When she target the quota, what happens? They shout at us. They beat us. And is that common? Are they allowed to use the bathrooms whenever they need to? Are they allowed to use the bathrooms whenever they need to? Are they allowed to use the bathrooms they need to? Are they allowed to use the we cannot go when we want to. Do they have to like, get permission to raise their hand? Do they have to get permission to raise their hand? Card. card. So we, we need to take a card. How many times can they go during the day? Ek dinay koi bar toilet jate baro. Mane kore ek dinay koi bar jate baro maximum. Two or three. Two to three times. Mm -hmm. And do they monitor how much time they take? Jokon tumra ke baat tumhe dai. Swar baat rakhi dekhiye de kotho kotho thakilor modde baat tumhe modde. Dekhiye. The monitor. The monitor. And if you take too long, what happens? Jodi kono swami. Bathroom on a Kuntaki, whenever Bishish Moita, the Lake Kihoi, the Lake Mare Mare, the beat to the world. And are the bathrooms clean? Is there soap and toilet paper and water? The other bathroom and Monteki, Saban, tissue paper, Taki? No. There is no soap, no toilet, no tissue paper. Like a Polish car, clean, Polish car? No. No. Camon and a camon, who is it? Bathroom with the camon. When she's at work, how does what does she think about? How does she feel when she's working all day like that? You do all day in the class, Guru. And tomorrow, all of the tomorrow, what will you do? Monday. Did you sleep? Huh? I I feel very bad. Like how? Just keep up with the ball, ball, Guru. You mean that class, Guru, tomorrow, what will you do? What will you do? I feel very tired, exhausted. Here is a picture or two of the 2013 Savar building collapse. The Savar building names a, a sweatshop, an eight story sweatshop in which almost 1200 sweatshop workers were killed in 2013. This happened after there was an earthquake, um, big fissures formed in the big cracks formed in the building um, that building also was home to some professional offices and the professionals at the at those offices stopped coming to the building because it looked unsafe. 
but the sweatshop owners ordered the sweatshop workers to go to work, um, of course, or they'd be fired. And so they came and the building collapsed on them. This is also in Bangladesh. Okay, so I assigned to you a video by Matt Zwolinski, who's a libertarian philosopher. I actually assigned you a couple videos by him. And in those videos, he stresses uh, three points that sweatshops do make their employees better off because they go there voluntarily. They are mutually beneficial and uh, they, you know, the only reason people are showing up for those jobs, indeed those jobs are in fairly high demand is because those jobs are better than the other options that people have. So, so related to one, if you shut down those sweatshops for whatever reason, you will actually end up harming workers more than letting them work at those sweatshops. And hiring people at low wages that they are willing to accept because it's better than anything else they have is better than doing nothing. All right, and most of us are doing nothing. So most of us are not sending money to this poor girl in Bangladesh. I'm not, right? So she could either um, starve or do some worse work, um, or I can buy a t-shirt that's produced in the sweatshop there, and at least she has some, some, some employment. So it isn't, it isn't clear that they would be any better off if you just closed the sweatshop, given the, other given the other options they have and things you're willing to do to help them. Now in the discussion by the labor leader, you would hear words like starvation wages. Well, these are not starvation wages. If they were starvation wages, the sweatshop workers would not, would not show up because people will not work and starve. If, if they're really going to starve, they will just not work and starve. So the fact that these workers show up to work uh, is proof alone that they're not literally starvation wages. Uh, we also hear that they are robbed of their wages. That may be true in the sense that they are not given the wages that they are originally promised or are contracted for. In the third world, a lot of contracts are um, just sort of legal fictions um, in case the government checks up on you or something like that. But everyone involved knows that the real wages are not going to be that. Even if a worker did think that they were going to get paid more, after they get paid less after, uh, after a couple of weeks of work, it dawns upon that worker that the real amount of money they will get paid is different than the promised amount of money they get paid. So if I underpay you all through January, you will realize by the time we get to February that the, there's a real number that you will get paid for, per hour for work with, for me. And if you keep coming to work after that, it is questionable as to whether or not you've been robbed. It's almost like a new tacit contract has been struck. Um, again, as long as you're able to leave the work, if you keep coming back to the work, you have sort of tacitly accepted a new wage. Um, that, but that is, again, assuming that they don't know in the beginning what they're really going to get paid. When they do, uh, everyone at these sweatshops uh, certainly knows somebody else who works at those sweatshops and they have a very clear idea about how much uh, people actually get paid. We also heard the term forced to work and they're not, they're not forced to work. This is not slavery, I should say. So these people are free to leave and indeed the wages are so low because so many people are willing to take their place. That said, it is possible that they are not being given starvation wages. It is possible that they are not being robbed of their wages, that they know how much they're going to get paid and uh, are getting paid as much as they really expect to get paid and that they are not being literally enslaved and yet they are still being exploited. So the type of exploitation here would be not the exploitation of slavery, but an exploitation which there is a vulnerable party and a more powerful party 
and there is some sort of mutual benefit between that more vulnerable party and more powerful party. So both parties are benefiting. But nonetheless, and here's the tough part to articulate, there's something about the mutually beneficial relationship that is somehow unjust or unfair, all right? And, and what, what must be the case before that mutually beneficial relationship becomes unfair or unjust is very much debated. But let me give you a thought experiment. Suppose Jill is piloting a small plane across the desert and she, uh, her plane uh, has a mechanical failure and she crash lands in the desert and she's wandering for days. She's parched, she's starving. She's, she's an hour away from death, from just lying down and dying. And in the distance she sees a dust cloud, hears something and lo and behold, it is a Jeep. And the Jeep rolls up to her and in the Jeep is Jack. And Jack, Jack says, wow, you seem to be in a lot of trouble. And Jill says, yes, yeah, can you help me? And Jack says, I can't help you. Uh, there is, I have a trunk load of energy bars and water bottles. And I can drive you to the nearest city. Um, but it will cost you something. You have to have sex with me first. What are your intuitions about what Jack is doing to Jill? Is Jack raping Jill? Um, well, suppose Jill says no. Jack says, I see. Well, I wish you the best of luck. And he drives away. So he is not forcing himself upon her. He is not in any way lying to her. So it's, there's transparency here. The indecent proposal, as it were, that he is offering her would be mutually beneficial in the sense of he would get something from it, namely the sex that he wants, and she would get something from it, namely the food, water, and her life being saved. So this case of Jack and Jill seems to be one in which, like the sweatshop case, Jill is not being physically forced to perform anything. Uh, she is not being lied to, right? She knows what she's going to get, let's say, and let's say Jack would, would give it to her. So she's not being cheated in that sense. Um, and she is offered something that is mutually beneficial to her. And if she, if she takes Jack up on the offer, one would say that, you know, she did do something that benefits her, that she benefited from the offer as indecent as it is the offer that Jack gave her. So Jack is giving her an offer that has something in it for her that benefits her and him. And yet it seems highly exploitative. So let's look a little bit deeper at these. One argument in defense of sweatshops is that sweatshop labor is after all voluntary. If the sweatshop worker didn't think that it was in their best interest to work there, they wouldn't work there. We're not dealing with slavery. So we can put this in argument form. If a relationship is voluntary, it's consensual. If it's consensual, it's morally permissible. Sweatshop labor agreements are voluntary. The, sweatshop, the sweatshops do not have to round people up with sticks and so forth and, and chain them to their uh, you know, chairs or anything like that. So um, it follows logically that sweatshop labors are permissible. Which premise here do you disagree with? Is it the voluntariness consensual um, uh, premise or is it the, if it's consensual, it's morally permissible premise? Maybe, maybe all the premises are correct. It's important for us to think a lot about mutual benefit this builds on the earlier point that people wouldn't be working at sweatshops voluntarily unless they were being benefited. So it must be that the sweatshop or factory is giving them an option they didn't have before and an option that in fact is better than what they had before. Okay. This leads to this argument from options. It is never wrong merely 
to add to someone's options. Sweatshops merely add to poor people's labor options. So sweatshops are not doing anything immoral. Um, this is a valid argument. Is it sound? Is, are these premises true? Um, consider premise one, it is never wrong merely to add to someone's options. How could, I, how could I make you worse off by just giving you more options? Even if it's an obviously bad option, even if I stand outside the classroom and I have a baseball bat, and as you leave the classroom, I say, hey, would you like to get hit in the knees with a baseball bat? And if you say no, I say, okay, no problem, have a nice day, right? I've added to your options. You, you, before you, you could just walk out of the classroom, but now, you have the option of walking out of the classroom or getting hit in the knees. So I've added to your choice set. Obviously, I've added a really bad option to your choice set. But you don't have to choose it. So how did I make you worse off? And it's especially hard to see how I harm you if I give you an option that is potentially beneficial to you. Like, would you like this potted plant? You know, maybe you're not into the potted plant. Okay, fine. I haven't made your life worse. Uh, but some people are looking for potted plants and, and here you have a potted plant. So merely adding to your option as you leave the classroom can't make you worse off. And so if I'm not making you worse off uh, by merely adding to your options, then how am I wronging you? How am I therefore doing anything wrong to you? But again, if this is right, if, the, if, if this argument is sound, that means Jack, it would seem to mean that Jack is merely adding to Jill's options, right? Because she was just going to die. Then he appears on the scene and gives her an option. In this case, an option that is potentially uh, one she might want to take, unlike being just hit in the knees with a baseball bat. Okay? So how is it that Jack is, um, is, is doing anything immoral by offering to help Jill out in that way, if you want to call it that. Now, I think we can agree that if Jack sabotaged Jill's plane before she left and she, her plane um, had a mechanical malfunction because of his sabotage, and then he pulls up and gives her the indecent proposal, I think in that case, we have very clear intuitions that he is doing something, even clearer intuitions that he's doing something wrong, right? But, but plausibly, plausibly, that's because we feel like he has actually not added to Jill's set of choices, that he has actually shrunk Jill's set of choices. So what he's doing in the sabotage variant is, sink, is shrinking her choices to those choices of a desperate person stuck, you know, stranded in the desert. Whereas before she had the choices of a not desperate person with a functional plane, which is much greater. Likewise, you know, if, if, I, if I hold you up in a dark alley on your way to the movies and I point a gun at you and I say, your money or your life. I'm giving you a choice, yes, but I have shrunk. You, you had the option to give me money before I held you up, <laughs> okay? You could, get, you could give random people money and you could kill yourself, but you could also have done all these other things like keep walking on your way, going to the movies, grabbing an ice cream cone or whatever. But I have shrunk your choices down to two, giving me your money or dying. And so, you know, that doesn't apply to these cases, right? Because I have clearly wronged you and I've, by shrinking your choice set to uh, a, a choice you should not have to make. But in the original Jack and Jill scenario, Jack had nothing to do with the malfunction in Jill's plane. He is perhaps being opportunistic. It'd be hard to deny that. But um, the, wrong, the wrongness of his action 
um, isn't one in which that involves in any way his reducing her choice set. So he's actually, in fact, adding to it. And if this argument is sound, then Jack is doing nothing wrong. And that's even more extreme than what sweatshops are doing, perhaps. Now, some people think sweatshop owners must be slimy, that they are, as it were, opportunists that are um, just feeding off the vulnerability of poor people, much like Jack is um, taking advantage of a vulnerable person in the case of Jill, of the Jack and Jill case. Um, that may be true to some degree. Um, that's a different question though, as to whether or not these sweatshops do benefit these workers, or if the system in which these opportunistic capitalists work is one that benefits these workers. So here's a very common defense of sweatshops from an economic perspective. Uh, premise one, poor people need work most. So poor people are willing to work for least, uh, work for the least amount of money, okay? Um, capitalists are interested in cheap labor. So this looks like a marriage made, uh, well, I don't know in heaven, but it's, it's, you could see why they, the capitalists would be attracted to the poorest, right? The, the, the person trying to make money from their capital through buying a factory would be interested in the cheapest possible labor. So because of this, capitalists are incentivized to bring their factories to the poorest areas. Sweatshops, of course, become uh, more and more common when you have uh, a, a situation where the factory infrastructure, whatever infrastructure can be easily moved. And now that, you know, the third world is you know having better and better roads more and more reliable supply chains um there is increasing uh ability for capitalists to move fact move factories to the poor poor places poorest poorest places on the on earth so uh the 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 fact that the poorest people are willing to work for the least and the fact that the capitalist is trying to make the most money he or she can means that the capitalist is incentivized to bring their factories to the poorest areas. So capitalists are incentivized by the invisible hand of the marketplace, as it were, to do something that helps the poor, right? Out of, out of the capitalist self-interest. And again, this is more than what you or I do for the poor. So capitalists do, in fact, more than you or I do for the poor. But they are not doing it for the best reasons. And you know what, if Jack, if Jack helps Jill, he has done more for you, for Jill than you have. Okay. You, uh, you weren't there to rescue Jill. So would you rather her just die? Um, um, so, so, you know, what's going on? Would you want to force Jack to help her in some way? What if Jack didn't want to help on those terms? Likewise, what if capitalists don't want to help on those terms? So if, if you just in, insist that capitalists pay their workers more money, you may, the amount of money, very possibly the amount of money that you want them to pay their workers would make it um, not worth the capitalist time to set up that factory in that poor country. So they'll just leave their factory where it presently is, which is a less poor country. And so you will actually be harming um, those you mean to help. How important is it to you that the people paying the workers have the right motives? We must keep in mind, the economist points out, that sweatshops appear in, in areas that are being industrialized. All right, so, and when that area industrializes more, the labor market contracts, that is to say labor becomes scarcer, labor then becomes kind of too expensive to make a sweatshop profitable in that area. So the sweatshops have to move on to an area where people are poor yet, and yet the supply, the supply chains are, are good enough, the roads are good enough and so forth. So uh, we saw sweatshops go, sweatshops appear in all the places that were rapidly industrializing. The first sweatshops, of course, were in England in, in the mid 19th century, and then the USA, and then 
when I was a kid, there, when I was a young kid, there were sweatshops in Japan, but there aren't many sweatshops in Japan today because labor is way, way too expensive in Japan. Um, so in over most of my life, they were in China. Now they're becoming too uh, expensive in China. And so the sweatshops, as, as China industrializes, although China does have a lot of people, um, so that's going to take a while, but already, you know, sweatshops are have been moving for oh, well over a decade in mass to places like Vietnam and Bangladesh and Honduras and other places. And, and one hope, one might hope that those places become industrialized enough that it becomes too expensive to hire a Vietnamese uh, because the, the Vietnamese worker has too many options uh, at, at those sorts of labor costs. And so the sweatshops would just move on to the next frontier. Here, how so I, I've tried to say a little bit, I guess, in favor of, of sweatshops. Um, but there are some things to, there are some things that I think we need to keep in mind because everything here is not about money. There is also safety. And safety can be translated to money. Uh, we cannot doubt that. So for instance, people will take more dangerous jobs to get paid more, all right? So one of the reasons you get paid more as a logger or as an Alaskan crab fisherman, is that it's, those are really dangerous jobs. You get paid more to paint the top of a smokestack than to paint a house. Why? Because a lot of people who paint smokestacks uh, fall to their death. All right? It's an intrinsically dangerous job. Um, I, I, think there are peop I think these people who do underwater welding, they make on average like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 a year as underwater welders. Why? Because it's a very dangerous job in part. Now, not only is it tough and high skilled, but they are getting, as it were, danger pay, right? And you may think that's, that's good. Um, you know, people in dangerous jobs should get paid more. Well, what about jobs that don't have to be as dangerous? So what about, you know, so suppose we had two factories, factory A and factory B. And factory B was, had a lot of safety equipment, but because of that, because they put so much money into safety equipment, it would only be profitable for them to run if they pay their workers $10 an hour. And factory B pursues a different strategy. They don't have any safety equipment, so they don't spend much money on safety. And because of that, they could pay their workers $15 an hour, all right? Um, and in fact, they have to pay their workers more because the workers aren't dumb. They know that if they could work at factory A that is safe for $10 an hour, they're not going to work at factory B for $10 an hour. That's not safe. But if factory B um, offers to pay them $15 an hour, then, they've, then they get the interest of some workers. Who? Well, there are going to be some workers who prioritize money over safety. Maybe they have a lot of children, all right? Or maybe they desperately need cash to pay off some loan that a mafioso is going to, you know, break their legs if they don't pay off. So, um, you know, those guys are desperate for money and, and they're willing to take uh, less safety for more money. From a libertarian point of view, right, from a, a basic libertarian point of view, they should be allowed to make that choice. That's why a lot of libertarians think that the government shouldn't uh, have so many safety regulations, that pe the marketplace should decide how much safety is uh, the right amount of safety. And the right amount of safety may well differ from factory to factory according to the needs and interests of the owners and the workers there. One complicating uh, variable here though is that it's often tough to tell how unsafe a workplace is, especially for the workers. So when you think about those workers in that building in Bangladesh that collapsed, they couldn't possibly know how dangerous it was to work there. They, for instance, wouldn't have come that day if they knew it was going to fall that day. And they're not you know, trained as architects or anything else to tell how dangerous it is. And so um, because, because of that, uh, we, we may think that we just need experts to, to tell us how dangerous something is and that workers should be informed of that. Fine. But that, that would be pretty expensive. 
And that would be a type of regulation that often won't be enforced in the third world. Another thing to think about is that if you're really going to accept uh, an unsafe work condition, um, you have to wonder whether or not the costs of your getting hurt are really being, as economists would call it, internalized to yourself. So if you lose your hand in a workplace accident at an unsafe workplace at, say, Factory B, are you the one that pays for that? Are you the one that pays for the medical care? Are you the one that pays for the uh, disability care that you have afterwards and so forth? Uh, maybe not. Maybe your insurance does. Maybe the government does. And so the taxpayers do, right? All that gets distributed to taxpayers. And, and given that we know that if you're hurt, you're going to cost the rest of society money, we may just say, well, we're not going to let you make a choice of offloading the, the costs of your risky um, venture onto society. We're going to make you internalize that from the get-go. And that means we're not going to let you earn that extra money in the hope that you don't get hurt. We're just going to impose regulations on factories, force factories to put the money into that, force you to have a lower wage because of that, right? But nonetheless, we are, we are uh, protecting ourselves. And a third thing to keep in mind is that people are often irrational about risk. They often think, young men especially, rarely think that they're going to be the ones who get hurt. Okay, so... It, you know, I remember what it's like to being young. I, I remember what it's like thinking I'm invincible, thinking that I'm smarter and luckier than everyone else, that it's not going to happen to me, okay, and, and taking a lot of crazy risks. This is very common. Obviously, a lot of these uh, thoughts apply to minimum wage. The more expensive the labor, the less incentive a firm has to hire people because you have to be all the more skilled for the firm to make money off of your labor. So if you if minimum wage is say at $50 an hour, you better be able to supply the firm a value that's equivalent to at least $51 an hour. You know? So uh, if you can't do that, if there's nothing that you know how to do that makes some firm 51 or plus dollars an hour, no, no one's going to hire you for $50 an hour. So if you made the minimum wage $50 an hour, there'd be, um, you'd be unemployed. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the same applies even for $15 an hour. There are lots of people who don't have the skills, any skills that are worth more than $15 an hour to an employer. And so those people will be shut out of the labor market if you set the minimum wage at $15 an hour. And there are a lot of negatives to having a lot of people who are not hired. Whereas if you, if you didn't have a minimum wage, you would have people with very low skills still able to get jobs because um, the 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 Seven Eleven or whatever could say, well, you know, you you could sweep at least, and um, it's you know it's worth four dollars an hour to have you sweep. You're not worth fifteen dollars an hour. I'll just hire a cleaning company uh, that could that could do it for cheaper than that. But you know, for four dollars an hour, yeah, I'll hire you. It's worth it. Um, you know, with minimum wage laws, those 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 people aren't getting hired. So when it comes to minimum wage, we have to wonder about not only are we actually harming the economy, are we harming not only the employers, but the potential employees by putting a lot of them out of work. But we also have to worry about this sort of moral question about whether the government has a right to interfere with our uh, business dealings. So if you think the government shouldn't have a right to decide who you get to have sex with, like as long as it's voluntary voluntary and consensual and so forth. Why, you know, if you think the government shouldn't get in the way of who you hold hands with, why do you think the government should ha have the right to get in the way of who you hire? As long as the, that person and you agree, as it were, shake hands on the deal. Um, of course, the employee would like to make more and the employer would like to pay more, less. But uh, the, you know, if they come to an agreement, they do because it's mutually beneficial. And how is the government making anything better by swooping in and keeping those people from that deal? Well, if you, if you can sort of grasp that when it comes to minimum wage in, in this country, you could sort of grasp this, how that applies 
uh, just as well to sweatshops. If there are sweatshops and there are potential sweatshop workers and the sweatshop would be happy to hire the worker at $2 a day, the sweatshop would rather pay the worker $1 a day, but they can't get anyone for that, but they'll, they'll, okay, they'll, they'll, they'll pay $2 a day. And the worker, if the worker um, is willing to work for $2 a day as well, sure, the worker would like to be paid $200 an hour, but okay, the worker will take $2 per, per day over not working or working for less somewhere else. If, if they're reaching that mutually beneficial um, point of compromise, what right does a government have to step in? Or what right do you have to step in and, and keep them from that mutually beneficial uh, arrangement? S would, would say a certain sort of libertarian. But maybe we do need to be paternalistic. Now, paternalism is when you force a weaker party, when a stronger party forces a weaker party to do something for the weaker party's good, not for the stronger party's good. It's acting like a potter, acting like a father, okay? In Latin is potter. So, um, you know, I force my kids to do things, uh, eat their vegetables and so forth, not for my good, but for their good. So I'm being paternalistic when I do that. Does the government have the right to be paternalistic about wages, to be paternalistic about industries, what industries are available to workers to work in, et cetera, for the worker's benefit, even though it goes against what the workers want? Um, and, and again, the best reason for this, perhaps, is that the workers don't understand what is in their own long-term good because they may be uneducated. That, that's the case of workers who want to work at the sweatshop, even though it is in great danger of collapsing because it has these big cracks in it from an earthquake, but they don't understand the risk. They just see the cracks and they think, oh, well, that's just cracked paint. You know, they don't get the, the, how structurally unsound that factory is. So because, and, and as would I be, like, I don't know, if, you, if I see a crack in, in the building I teach in, I would just still go in because I, I just assume it's going to stay up. Because it's been up, so I just assume it's going to stay up. I have no architectural training, engineering training, to tell that that's a dangerous building. So if someone stopped me, I'd say, you know, I could say, well, what right do you to have, have to stop me from going into a building that I want to go to and so forth, right? But I don't know what I'm doing. And so a little paternalism might be very helpful there. Or emotional, as I said, because I think I can't get hurt because I think I'm Superman, and so forth. I, you know, I don't need any sort of regulation on uh, anything. So just, you know, let me make my choices. Well, again, even if I, even if I do have full information, uh, my some irrationality on my part may make it the case that some paternalism would be good. So maybe the state should force firms to adhere to regulations because even though workers would rather work for more money or have more access to jobs, the workers don't know as well as the government what is in their best interest. Here is where we face the prospect that there might be some collective action problems around, around sweatshops. So a collective action problem will occur whenever there's some benefit from doing X but we would all benefit more if we did Y. We would collectively benefit more if we did Y, right? But getting Y, getting that Y benefit requires that few or none of us do go after X, right? But if we suspect that there will be some defectors, if we suspect that there will be enough people that for their selfish reasons go after X, we realize that we may as well go after X too. And so we all go after X and we miss out on Y. All right. So it may be that some industry opens that makes the lives better for some workers, but this industry harms the overall culture or nation. And in this case, we have a situation where workers are like defectors. And since we 
you know, even though we'd rather have no one work there, given that some will work there, we may work there as well. So suppose that our little neighborhood would be better if there were no drug dealers. But there are like a dozen people in our neighborhood that are willing to be drug dealers. And sure, our neighborhood would be nicer and safer if none of us were drug dealers, but these guys want to deal drugs because they make a lot of money when they do. And so they get tempted by that and they start dealing drugs and they just, oh, sure. They hope that you and I won't deal drugs. They want to be the only ones dealing drugs. Sure. Because they want the benefits of a safe neighborhood while they uh, profit from the sell, profit from selling drugs. But enough of them are selling drugs that the neighborhood is, unsafe anyway so we may as well sell drugs all right so if we know the neighborhood's going to be unsafe anyway hell we may as well sell drugs too and and make money while we can before everything falls apart given that given that some are selling drugs even if people selling drugs isn't going to all by itself make our neighborhood unsafe the fact that they are both benefiting from the selling of drugs and benefiting from our sacrifices of not selling drugs irritates us and we feel like we're suckers. And so that encourages us still to sell drugs so we're not the suckers and then lose the benefit of, of, um, of, the, of the safe neighborhood, okay? So what if, I'm just throwing this out there, I don't know if this is the case, but what if it would be better for a society not to have anyone work at the sweatshops, all right? To in, instead uh, work together to pursue some other sort of industry, like say ecotourism or something like that. Um, great, you know, maybe. Um, are you going to keep those people though that want to work at the sweatshop from working at those from working at the sweatshop? Is that other industry available to them as a live option to keep them alive in the meantime. I don't really know what to say. If the government is strong enough and capable enough that it can, it could keep the sweatshops out while giving the people another better option of an industry to keep them employed, like say ecotourism or high tech jobs or whatever. Great. Yeah. If that's going to happen, great. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what should happen. Okay, but you know, that's very unlikely to happen. So there is this uh, worry here about path dependency that um, if we, be, if we uh, become a nation where we are a place for sweatshops to get set up, then we're going to have a nation full of sweatshops and a, and a particular sort of culture if we go in another direction and we, and we pr promote, say, ecotourism, we may end up with a much nicer culture. So in summary, we must grant that sweatshops may be broadly good for workers. Um, but we should still worry about some aspects of sweatshops. First, we have to worry about anti-competitive legislation or anti-competitive corruption. Much like the case of Jack and Jill, where uh, the option, where the variant where Jack sabotages Jill's plane and then gives her the indecent proposal once she's already crash landed. If sweatshops are bribing local officials, keeping out co competing sweatshops from coming into the town, that's like sabotaging the workers, right? Because you're keeping out that anti-competitive corruption is keeping out other places that those workers can work and thus drive up the price of their labor because they have more options, okay? So um, how much of that is going on in these cases? Probably, there's probably some of that going on, uh, but I don't know. Uh, insofar as sweatshops use legal means, it doesn't have to just be illegal corruptions. And so insofar as they use legal means to keep the country poor, to keep more industries from coming in, 
so that they can um, have a monopoly on cheap labor. That, that sort of stuff starts looking like clear cases of immoral exploitation um, where that are similar to the cases where Jack sabotages Jill's plane. I think we have to worry about the transparency of what's going on. Uh, so there's going to be high transparency about wages. Um, you, could, you could steal from the workers occasionally, but they're going to get a very good idea of how much they're being actually paid. And so the wages are fairly transparent. What is much less transparent, as we saw with um, the case of uh, the Savelle collapse, that um, is, are things like the danger of workplace conditions. Okay, so they don't really know if the building's going to fall apart on them. They don't really know if they're going to get cancer from this new type of treatment on the acid wash genes or whatever they have, right? Um, they, they don't know any of that stuff. They don't know the dangers from the dust of this new, of this new uh, fabric or whatever. So there's, there's not a lot of transparency about that. And insofar as that's not transparent, it's not clear that the workers are making informed decisions. I think there are other cultural things that they're not really sure about. Um, they're, they're probably not sure about what the costs are to their children by being away for so much longer. Maybe it's better for them to be even poorer, but with their children more, who knows, right? And that, that is out. I think a lot of people in first world countries don't understand the costs of working to their families and their culture, right? So it may be that um, even in the first world country, a lot of people are working more than they should and they should be staying more at home, but they, they have a hard time realizing what the real costs are of, of doing this sort of work that they're doing. And that could be a secretary in a cushy apartment, uh, in, in a cushy uh, air conditioned, you know, building. So, um, you know, that's a tough one too. And, and not, not one that applies just to sweatshops. I think a lot of the abuses we saw early on in those videos doesn't have to do with the sort of stuff libertarians talk about, like money. You know, what we're, what we're seeing in those videos is stuff like women being smacked with a stick for talking. Uh, workers having duct tape put on their mouth if they talk too much to their neighbor. Workers not being able to go to bathroom uh, more than once or twice, you know, every eight hours or something like that. Workers being, you know, having a lunch room with that's outside in the open air. Okay, fine. But there's not even a tarp strung out across it. And, and tarps are cheap. That's not really a money problem. Um, workers who ha have to go to bathrooms where there's no soap in the bathroom. So soap does not cost a lot of money, okay? The reason that they don't have soap in the bathrooms is one of culture, not, one, not, not a financial decision. The reason they don't have a tarp up is because they just don't value the employee's health or well-being, not because the tarps are expensive. The tarps are not expensive. It's totally relevant. The reason they're taping up the employees' mouths and hitting them with sticks is because they think that they'll work harder if they're not chatting. There's probably no evidence for this, and it's probably not true. Okay? These, it's just because of this ir perhaps irrational thought that, you know, the more, uh, the, the more happy a worker is, the less productive they are. Okay? So there are a lot of stupid cultural things that are being done at these factories that aren't, aren't, don't actually redound to making them more productive, but that make the employees' lives worse than they have to be. And so um, those could all be eliminated, all right? And, and, and you could be pro-sweatshop for libertarian reasons. You could be pro-sweatshop pro for invisible hand, market-based re reasons, and not be at all a defender of those uh, sort of stupid practices that have nothing to do with productivity. 
And last, I think we need to think about path dependency. You know, is it possible for a country to sort of channel itself into a sweatshop economy when it could uh, maybe uh, develop in some other direction that is less harmful, uh, better for families and so forth? I don't know. In some cases, no. In some cases, ecotourism won't be an option. And by the way, you know, ecotourism might not be the greatest either. There are a lot of economies on islands in the Caribbean and so forth that revolve around tourism. And uh, they don't have a lot of sweatshops, right? Everything is, is around the tourist industry. Okay, um, I, those jobs are probably better than sweatshops, than sweatshop jobs. I think driving uh, American tourists around in your little mini bus, you know, going to beach to, to uh, bar and so forth is probably a lot better than working in one of these sweatshops, yes. But is it long-term better for a country to be uh, sort of 100% into tourism as opposed to sweatshops? Because, well, maybe, maybe the sweatshops develop into factories and industry that actually that, that benefit that society way more over the course of, say, a century because the factories re replace sweatshops and then tech startups replace factories and universities and so forth start appearing and you have a sort of buildup of human capital in a place that goes the industrial route that you won't have in a place that goes the tourist route so if you grow up in a, a tourist paradise well yeah it's pretty and all and you know you had an easy job as a teenager and so forth but where's your opportunity to grow as a person you, you're you're eventually going to want to go to some place that has a, a sort of industrial economy or post-industrial economy. So, you know, and the post-industrial economy comes after the industrial economy. So maybe the sweatshop, uh, the sweatshop type economy is, is a better one than even hell, even than eco tourist one, you know, setting aside all these considerations about ecology. So it's a complicated, complicated topic. Um, but I hope you got something from it. Um, and we could talk more about the nature of exploitation, the Jack and Jill case, whether we really could harm somebody by giving them more options, because you know what? It is very possible that you can harm people by giving them more options. There are, there are counterexamples to that. Um, one example that I'll talk to you about is the example in the movie Indecent Proposal, where um, uh, an otherwise happy couple is offered a million dollars by a, by a, a rich tycoon for one night with, with the man's wife, okay? And this sends them into a tailspin because they kind of need the money, uh, they, but they were, they were happy where they were at, and it ends up ruining their marriage. So there is a possibility that more um, options can act, that having more options can make you worse off. And if that's right, there is a real possibility that even offering somebody more options actually wrongs them.